welcome to Rosalia Bookstore. Um, thank you all so much for joining us tonight. We're really delighted to have you all here to celebrate Edward Sorrell and his wonderful memoir, Profusely Illustrated. Without further ado, please join me in welcoming Edward and Daniel. Thank you. Thank you, thank you very much. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here to talk about, this is part of a series of Rizzoli's emerging young artists and the future of their career. And to be able to salute this young man, man next to me is a, a great uh, tribute. It's a, 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 I'm very happy to be doing it. I'm also very happy to tell you that uh, having read Ed's book a couple times, the stories that he tells in it are the same stories that he's been telling me for 30 years. So I think that they are actually true. Um, <laughs> So, young man, how are you? <laughs> um, let me just, we'll start briefly at the beginning and then get to your career. Born in the Bronx, to a mother you loved and a father you did not. How did you become an artist? How did I what? <laughs> become an artist. <laughs> oh, oh, <laughs> what choice did I have? No, it was very easy to become an artist because I really was bad at everything else. I was a poor student and it was easy. Mm -hmm. I, as soon as, uh, as soon as my mother heard that he that I made beautiful pictures from the teachers, she immediately sent me to a to a school for poor kids on Saturday uh, that gave me art supplies, and I was an artist from that point on. So I was an artist from the time I was ten years old. And what, what was the art that you were doing as a kid? Was that? What kind of art were you creating as a kid? Oh, oh I was doing uh, the street scenes, uh, people doing things, uh, <coughs> people, people at a baseball game, things like that. Did you imagine it was a career? <laughs> no, I, I, I was going to do anything to get out of the house. I, I, didn't, I didn't think in terms of a career, I thought in terms of a job. Uh, I would do, I think for a while I was a door-to-door -door salesman, but... Uh, what were you selling? I was selling a uh, kitchen set, uh, apron, dish, dish towel, and uh, napkin sets uh, on the installment plan. <laughs> no, it wasn't on the installment plan. But, but you managed to make it through high school and then you crossed over into Manhattan. Yeah. To Cooper Union. Made it to Cooper Union. Well, I was always, uh, music and art was in, oh, okay, it was right, in right, Manhattan. Right. And yes, I, I, I failed the test to Cooper Union. I was madly in love with a girl at music and art. And we, we both took the test at the same time. She made it and I didn't. And that was pretty much the end of that romance. But, uh, <laughs> But the reason I, I, I didn't fail the art test, I failed the intelligence test. Uh, and uh, the intelligence test was uh, algebra. So I had an uncle who, I had an uncle who, who had gone to Princeton and studied with Einstein. And he was pressured by my aunt to teach me, to, to teach me algebra. He was not pleased. Uh, and uh, he taught me the algebra, and I passed the intelligence test and passed the art test, and uh, and I would wave to my old girlfriend in the hall sometimes. <laughs> this was at Cooper by then. At Cooper, yes. Yeah. Yeah, so, so at Cooper, were you studying to be an illustrator, designer, a house painter? What were you up to? <coughs> uh, Cooper Union was only interested in abstraction. There was a three-year course that you had to take, which was called two-dimensional design. And it meant that whether you were drawing a locomotive or a bowl of fruit, it was to be done flat with two colors. And uh, that, was, that was, I learned how to do that. But I also unlearned how to draw. Mm -hmm. So by the time I got out of Cooper Union, I couldn't draw, but fortunately I got fired from Esquire magazine on the same day that Seymour Quast got fired. <clears throat> so uh, we, 
I talked him into us starting a studio. I would carry around the portfolio with his drawings, and uh, we would get rich. <laughs> <laughs> and we almost did. Um, and you had two other partners. Right. Well, after a while, our classmate Milton Glaser came back from his Fulbright in Bologna, mm -hmm. and uh, and he uh, he helped a little bit. Yeah, he did, and he he turned out all right. I yeah, think, he he know. really yeah. I, I he I always thought he had promise, <laughs> uh, and uh, and uh, he turned out so well that they we were about to move to fancy quarters on 57th Street from our cold water studio downtown. <clears throat> and then I decided it was time to go out on my own. And that's what I did. Uh, on, the day, on the day before they moved uptown, I left the studio and uh, began freelancing. So, no, that's not quite true. I got a job with CBS as a designer because I still couldn't draw. Now, but, can we, I, I'm going to show some evidence of this now. Yes, okay, okay sure. All right, so Holiday for Strings, RCA Victor Records. Uh, yeah, that was, uh, th that was the example. Two colors, flat. And I learned to do it, and there was a surprisingly little market for it. <laughs> Can we, can, we, I, can we go on to something else? No, we're <laughs> sticking with this for a long time. No, I, I, one of the reasons I wanted to include this, Ed, is because to me there's nothing in this that is even a hint of what you began doing quite soon after that. Was no. that because they were telling you to do, do it this, or were you just not yet you? I wasn't me. I, I, did, I did this while I was at Pushpin. Uh, they... Uh, <coughs> They found somebody who, who could speak English well and could dress well, and he replaced me as the salesman of Pushman Studio. And I was, I was able to do the simple jobs. If they had a film strip in which I could copy somebody else, I did it. But gradually, I learned how to, how to do little drawings. And uh, Milton and Seymour were both tremendous. They taught me how to, they re-taught me how to learn, how to, how to draw. And, and I did learn, and this was one of the album covers I did while at Pushpin Studio. But then you moved on, and this is beginning to be the Ed Sorrell we know. So tell us about yeah. this piece. Well, instead, instead of, um, that I was always, I was nothing. You have to understand, I was stealing from everybody in the whole world, including David Levine. Uh, and somehow or other, you got, you have to understand, in the, it was the 50s, and it was impossible to fail. Every now and then, I meet somebody from that time period and all of, these, all of these people that I knew then think of themselves as self-made men, which is crazy because I got fired from 11 jobs my first year out of school. And every time I got fired, I got a job that paid more money. <laughs> and it was impossible to fail. So even though I was stealing from David Levine, I was getting a job from Esquire to steal from David Levine. Uh, so uh, that's the story on that. But this is the beginning of your, I mean, this is, obviously you can see Levine's influence, but the cross-hatching here is a little, yeah, you're doing was, something yeah, it early Sorrell. It was a little yeah. looser. Mm -hmm. And uh, I got better and better. The whole, the whole clue about art is to get better. And, and this appeared in print, or was it you finished it right at what time, as I recall? That, that appeared in Esquire, and I think, I can't remember, I did Bobby Kennedy and John F. Kennedy, and, and they were alive when I did them, but they were dead when the magazine came out, and it was a big embarrassment to the magazine. I think, I think, it, was, I think it was this one. Yeah, well, let's move beyond. So this Esquire in 1966, and there, those, 
There are those who think that this is really the beginning of the Sorel that you became, this particular piece. How what was the beginning about? of the Sorel that I became? And I did finally become the cartoonist and caricaturist I wanted to be. It came from being happy. I, I, my, my second marriage was a very happy one. And the happier I got, the better I became. And uh, How did this come about? This, this came about when I took studio space with four or five other uh, cartoonists or illustrators. And uh, I was hanging on by my fingernails, uh, taking any job that came my way. Uh, and suddenly, I got a phone call from George Lois asking me to do the cover of Esquire. This was far beyond my wildest dreams to do that. He had seen some of the drawings I did without tracing, and he loved them. So he wanted me to do it in that style. So he gave me this cover to do because Frank Sinatra wasn't going to pose as a, with a lot of flunkies lighting a cigarette. So, uh, so I did it, but I was so nervous that I rendered it. Instead of doing it freehand, I, I, I did it so it came out looking like a rubber mask of Frank Sinatra. And George Lois, I showed it to George. He rolled his eyes and he said, I'll give you 24 hours to do it over. So I did it over, overnight. And uh, uh, I think you can tell by the lines how nervous I was. <laughs> But it put you on the map. I mean, this is it what put me on, yeah, 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 essentially it put me on the map. Okay, the, yeah. uh, staying on the map, but also staying with some of the same subjects. This is, I think, about 20 years later you did this, Sinatra? This was, uh, this, is, this was done for New York Magazine. It was a spot about that big. And uh, I didn't have to, I, I obviously did it larger, but the fact that it was so small and so unimportant let me do it as free as I wanted. And I put it in the book because I wanted to show how wonderfully chaotic my line had become from the constipated line that I had in the beginning. Well, I'm not, this wouldn't be the constipated beginning. This is when you're ready. Your bowels are in good shape. Yeah, this, this is, up, yeah. my bowels are yeah, in good okay. shape now, right. yes. Um, well, a favorite subject. Um, then there are several of these pieces that you did in the uh, late 60s and 70s, in which you have, in this case, four, five, six, seven. You're, you're, you have to do uh, caricatures of 10 people for one piece of art. I presume yeah. that takes a lot of time. It's labor intensive. Yeah. Uh, wh one of the things that's great about this piece is that I think maybe with one or two exceptions, you can recognize everybody immediately, uh, which is a very difficult thing, I think, for. Uh, no, for an artist to do. actually, actually, that isn't, it isn't hard. At least I don't think it's hard to do what I do because I don't, I don't do exaggerated caricatures. When you say you don't think it's hard, but you complain all the time about how you can't do it. It takes a long time. Yeah, okay, got it. So uh, the Atlantic specifically asks you, do these 10, ten people put Gertrude Stein and Shakespeare and Oscar Wilde and Tolstoy, et cetera, on the, on the cover you know, together? You know, th this was in 1960-something or 19, nine, I don't, 1970. It's a long time. I don't remember. I'm, I rather suspect that I was told who to do. Yeah. You did them well. So I can, I can tell by the, the laughter, the age of everybody in this room. You have to be old <laughs> enough to remember this guy. Uh, I, when Ed and I and, and Leo were going through uh, pieces that are in the book and deciding what to include in this, uh, in this, I said, you've got to include this Buckley. And Ed said, is that any good? And, and to me, this is, as, this is as good as it gets. I mean, you know him, even if you don't know anything about him, you know him from this, from this illustration. Okay, why argue? Okay. <laughs> <laughs> now, here's a, another. Uh, so no, that's this, a beautiful this guy, drawing. This guy was good for your career. Oh, my God, yes. He, 
He's really been terribly misunderstood. <laughs> he just wanted money. What's, what's the problem? The, the, reason, the reason he's praying, it was to illustrate. I did, I did a, a few pages in New York Magazine about what people said about him. And his Quaker minister in said, uh, had said that he's basically devout. And so I did that picture. And this is uh, Milhouse the first Lord of San Clemente, Duke of Key Biscayne, and Captain of Watergate. Uh, based on a piece, uh, a pre-existing piece. Yeah. Based on what? A pre-existing piece. I mean, the, 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 no? uh, well, it's based on a cartouche. I don't know who was in the yeah. middle yeah. of the yeah. circle. I swiped from everybody. Yeah, of course. Uh, it was from the New Yorker. I, <laughs> And uh, what can I say about well, it? Okay, well, let's, um, I got a couple questions about it. Uh, was Kissinger always part of the concept, or was, it, was that something that comes in, comes in later? I don't, I usually showed them a sketch of what I was going to do, and I'm sure that Kissinger was part of it from the very beginning. Uh, yeah, you had to, uh, yeah, they couldn't, they didn't trust artists enough to just say do it. Of course not. And uh, yeah, I, I guess he's pretty good. Yeah. I mean, I like the, the moon as the part of the hammer and sickle. <laughs> this I love. This is, uh, this is after he was out of office. This is uh, Will, Billy Graham and and uh, ben, uh, Norman Vincent Peale uh, taking him down from the cross. <laughs> and, and Billy Graham, by the way, uh, had said when, he, when Nixon was riding high that he, he's certain that God meant Nixon to be president of the United States. <clears throat> and for all we know, it's true. Is that why you're an atheist? <laughs> <laughs> um, it seems to me that, or would you argue that you are at your best when you're doing people that you really don't like? Yes. Yes. Well, here's to disprove that. Oh, whoops, I'm going too fast. Here's somebody that you also didn't like. This is fantastic. Yeah. Jerry Ford takes over. Yes. And in Nixon in the lower left. In the, in the, bottom, in the bottom left is uh, Nixon hypnotizing <laughs> Gerald Ford. You will grant me executive clemency. You will grant me executive clemency. But I put this here because this is somebody you loved. Uh, I think yes. that of, of all of your Hollywood pieces, it seems to me that you love doing Edward G. Robinson more than anybody else. I did. As I, in, in my book, I say, if I were a pharaoh, this is the drawing that I'd have buried with me. Uh, it was, uh, it Why? was. It was for a quarter page in The New Yorker. There, it had no right to be as good as it, as it is. But uh, occasionally, you find a piece of, of a photograph that's so good, you don't have to do anything to it. This is surprisingly close to a photograph from a movie he did called uh, The Woman in the Window. And, uh, and I did the whole thing freehand, except for the scissors. <laughs> Otherwise, it's a real drawing. But what, what, about, what about the accentuating certain characteristics? I mean, obviously, Robinson had an amazing face that this could be yeah. uh, done with. But the eyebrows, you, you picked the eyebrows, you picked the lips? Or no, it's they the lips. Themselves? Yeah, the lips were everything, yeah. yeah. Now, this piece didn't appear in any popular magazine of Jesus no. at the last flossing, if you can't read the bottom. <laughs> Uh, it's, my, it's my single favorite Sorel ever. Yeah. What were the circumstances? Clearly no magazine asked you to do this. No, uh, I, I became friends with Pat Oldefant, who to my mind was the greatest of all editorial cartoonists. And he invited me to stay with him in New Mexico, and where he, he had a, a, there was a etching workshop. So I, I had done etchings in high school, and, uh, and I had to draw some. I, I only know how to draw funny. 
when I have on occasion tried to draw serious emotional things that I try to be Kathy Collowitz, but when I <laughs> but when I do it, it comes out funny. And uh, but what were you intending to do with this? I mean, just, just to I, I was just to give do it, it to friends. To give it to friends. Thank you very much. So staying with the religious theme, uh, if you can't see this, uh, this is Moses' dog with a crowd of dogs. And on the Ten Commandments, heal, stay, come, sit, fetch, paw, lie, jump, sick em, beg. <laughs> okay, let me tell you the story of how this came about. I, uh, Graydon Carter was the editor of Spy Magazine, and he called to ask me to do a drawing for the magazine. I asked him what his page rate was. It was very low, and I said, I, I can't do it for that price. The following week, he called me up and invited me to lunch. And knowing that I was going to have lunch with him, I did a sketch, because I love doing anti-clerical cartoons. And uh, so I did this very fast cartoon of the dog Ten Commandments. And, uh, and I, after, after dessert, I showed it to him. And he handed it back to me, and he said, it's got, it's got Lee Lorenz's fingerprints. Now, Lee Lorenz was the art director of The New Yorker. And uh, I started to stutter, but, but no, I, I never did work for The New Yorker. But by an odd coincidence, I was having lunch with Lee Lorenz the but, next but day. But what Graydon was saying to you, this has been turned down yeah, by somebody pretty, else. Yeah, Why yeah. would I want this? Yeah, yeah. I, I, yeah. I, I, I forgot that part. Yeah, OK, I'm here for that reason. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah, he, he's, he meant it, you, it's been turned down by the New Yorker. You're giving me something that's been rejected. Uh, anyway, I, I showed it to Lee over lunch. And two weeks later, I had a full page in the New Yorker. So uh, it, was, it was a really. A, very meaningful. Was this done to illustrate anything, or was it just a freestanding, no caption cartoon in the New Yorker? There was no no, no, no caption. No caption necessary. No, no there was no caption. They don't do that very often. No. Uh, speaking of cartoons, uh, the caption on this one is: "Before we married, she seemed like the sort who would suffer a fool gladly." <laughs> yeah. Uh, different technique. Different technique. This is done with a grease pencil. And I love doing grease pencil if it's simple. And this is a simple illustration. Another cartoon back to yeah, this, similar this style. Is the most but announce the caption for this one. This is, on. Yes, I'll, I'll give it to them in, in a second. Obviously, you can see what it is. It's a very well-to-do father and his rebellious son. The examined life doesn't seem to bring in much income. <laughs> So the New Yorker, uh, this is your first New Yorker cover. Yeah. And, and, and was it Tina Brown's first it cover? It was Her Tina first Brown's issue. first cover. So. Tina Brown uh, leaves Vanity Fair. Uh, Graydon Carter takes, o takes over her job. And uh, she gives instructions to Lee Lorenz, who is still the art director, to get, to get covers from every artist in New York. And any, anybody that Lee Lorenz thinks is good, call them up and tell them that we will pay for the sketches even if we don't use them. This is unheard of. The New Yorker was strictly a speculative assignment. You, you, brought, you brought your art, and uh, if they rejected it, you just wasted your time. So. <clears throat> So when I walked into Lee Lorenz with my three sketches for covers, uh, his office, there wasn't any place to sit down. It was piled up. There were literally thousands of, of covers. And she came back from her vacation in some place. And, uh, and two of the three covers that she chose were mine. So I, was, I felt I was sitting pretty. And she wanted this one for her first issue. Uh, I think worth noting that back then, at that time, The New Yorker did not have covers that had anything to do with what was in the magazine. 
they were just pieces of art on their own. Yes. Whereas these days, more often than not, they are, they're illustrating yes. something. Right. In fact, I think almost all the time. Yeah. So this was at a time when you had much more freedom. Of course, right. you had freedom because you didn't even have the assignment. You could do whatever you wanted. But then begins your long career doing New York. Another thing to point out, this is 1992. The cover price on The New Yorker is $1.95. How much do you think it is now? Eight ninety-nine. I Wait, like the 99 cents. Also, also to be noted is the size of my signature. I was, I was determined that everybody would know who did the cover. Uh, yeah, this was one of my ambitious covers. You know, uh, I had terrific ideas that I wish somebody else could have done. I mean, doing every president who ever lived uh, is, uh, is... I double-checked it. There actually is a Millard, Millard Fillmore is it one of those faces back there. Yeah. I wouldn't have known because who knows what Millard Fillmore looked like, but you did your research. I did my research. Every one of these faces is, a, is, a, is, a, is an actual is a president. honest-to-God president, yeah. You know, Clinton always talked too long, so I assumed his inauguration would be long, too. And I had, I had uh, Teddy Roosevelt looking at his wristwatch. Which is, and the, the famous New Yorker checking department said, wait a minute, they didn't have wristwatch, men didn't wear wristwatches then. But uh, they, they, were, they were half right and half wrong. The truth is that men did, by and large, use pocket watches. <coughs> but, uh, but some men did wear wristwatches, even though it was considered a feat and feminine. And, uh, but the, the reason that men wore wristwatches after World War I was because of the need for grenade throwing. They had to count the seconds, so they needed a wristwatch. And after World War I, men wore wristwatches. Anyway. So much for the checking department. Yeah. So an, an, another one with 15 yeah, I very was, distinguishable faces. I was ambitious. What happened to that? Where did your ambition go? No, it, it's it, it's so slowly, what, what slowly. What was the occasion for this, this one? There was a fiction issue. Mm. Every year there's a fiction issue. And I loved the idea of highbrow and lowbrow. As a, as a cartoonist, who thinks of himself as an artist, uh, the question, you know, there are people uh, to this day who, who ask me whether I do painting. You know, why would I want to do painting when I can do funny pictures and do them artistically? Uh, so, uh, so the business of highbrow and lowbrow. No, it's, it's best it, illustrated it's, to me in the, in the lower left corner. Uh, Edith Wharton looking at Mickey Spillane. Uh, <laughs> yeah. Now that's a couple. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Uh, oh yeah, and this one. I thought this, this joke is so obvious. <laughs> She's waiting for her son to call. This was, this, but this was Mother's Day, the date this, of This 13. was Mother's Day. But uh, somebody wrote a, a terrific review uh, of, of, my, uh, of my book but he completely misunderstood the meaning of this cover. It, it, it was Jerome oh, Sharon. Oh, oh, okay. okay. Uh, okay. And, uh, and he thought that the joke was that she was upset by the modern phone. <laughs> <laughs> well, let's hope he's not doing many cartoons. Yeah. Okay. It's great, really great. And this, of course, is somebody in New York owns that painting. And uh, because after it came out, I, I heard from somebody who knew him that he, was, uh, he was, was surprised that his painting was suddenly on, on the New Yorker. Anyway, it's, it's a very famous primitive painting uh, of kids with the boat and the hoop and a book. And they're looking at these digital toys. Of Christmas today. is different. Yeah. And uh, this, this was always one of my favorite, even though I don't, I once, uh, I don't want to embarrass Jim, but uh, I once did a cover that had a lot of naked women in it. 
and I, I knew the, I knew the figures were terrible, and I had to go to Jim McMullen to help me draw them. Uh, I do not do naked women well. Uh, someone thought that she looked like a football player. Uh, <coughs> but nevertheless, I, I love the idea of, of all of us being satyrs and nymphs and, uh, and reaching old age and re reading the Wall, Wall Street, Street Journal. Journal. <laughs> Sinatra again. This is a, yeah. year, a year before he died, I think. But the only time that I had to do a cover over was because Tina Brown thought that Frank Sinatra looked too much like Johnny Carson. I don't know what I did to make him look more like Frank Sinatra, but this is, this is it. That's the best cover I ever did, I think, or one of the best. So th th this, uh, this subway, subway of the Animals, it, it, this was not to illustrate anything in the magazine. This is an idea of yours. Yeah. But was it an idea that had been around for a while and now, now I want to do it? Or did it pops no, up that day and no, then you I, do it? No, I, you know, I, the, the, the covers paid a lot of money. I wanted to do a cover. Yeah. So I kept thinking of ideas. That, uh, uh, surprisingly, very few of my ideas ever got turned down. Uh, and some of them weren't so good. But uh, we won't talk about those. Well, the next one you mentioned before, before we go to it, uh, that you draw, you draw funny. But the next piece, there's nothing funny about. No, so they, explain the circumstances. They, they called uh, <coughs> the day, the week after 9 11 happened, Art Spiegelman did a, a black, an all black cover. If you held it up to the light, you could see something else. But uh, the, on the second week, uh, they, they, they called upon me to do a cover about how New York was recovering. And I begged them not to ask me to do this. I said, oh, just go back to being funny. Uh, or just, I begged them not, I didn't want to do it. But uh, I had to do it, uh, so I, I don't know what made me think of people's legs, but that's what I did. I, and I did it in a light style. It, I, it wasn't morose. It wasn't. At all. In addition to, to the lightness of style, what's great about this is that it is absolutely self-explanatory, but not illustrating anything that is familiar to the eye. None of us are at ground level looking yeah. up from the curb, yeah. or at least not often. Uh, but it, it just worked instantly. I think it, it's. Yeah, it's, no. But it didn't make you want to do more serious work afterwards. No. No, okay. No. Okay, now we move to uh, a totally different medium, which is the, the two enormous murals he did <coughs> one for the Waverly Inn and one for the Monkey Bar, both commissioned by Graydon Carter. Right. And this is, tell us about this one. Well, let me show first. This is how, if you haven't been there, it wraps around the whole room, and every one of these figures is somebody who has figured prominently in the history of, of, the, of Greenwich Village. Right. Every, everybody, everybody is supposed to have, in the mural, supposed to have lived in Greenwich Village. I put in, I put in Cole Porter because I do a good Cole Porter. <laughs> but uh, but uh, he, had, he did a... a a show called uh, Greenwich Village Follies, I think. And so I put him in there. But uh, in, in case you can't, just, can I yes, please. tell you who they are? J.S. S.J. Perlman, Theodore Dreiser, Cole Porter, The Butterfly is Truman Capote. Uh, you left well, out Joan Baez up there, right? Oh, oh I forgot. I didn't. Uh, yes, Joan Baez in the tree playing a guitar. Uh, Walt Whitman. Isadora Duncan. Mm, no, Martha, uh, Graham. Gra Martha Graham, excuse mm -hmm. me. Martha Graham, uh, yeah. James Baldwin, Dodd, uh, what was her name? Mabel Dodge. Mabel yeah. Dodge, and John Reed and Joe Papp of the Public Theater. Fantastic. And, uh, but when you yeah. do these, you're not, you're not Michelangelo 
painting on the ceiling or Diego Rivera no. standing on, on, on a scaffolding? No, the, all, the, all the drawings were 13 inches high and they're blown up and actually there was a fire in the Waverly Inn and uh, the reporters kept calling, or at least a couple did, uh, how I feel about my, my mural being burned. I, ha I had to tell them that it, it's just a Xerox. <laughs> <laughs> uh, then your next book, <clears throat> or your, your penultimate book, um, yeah. your most recent book before this book, We'll call this the penultimate book because we expect another one after it, but explain this one. Mary Astor fell madly in love with George S. Kaufman when she, and uh, she, since, since everybody in New York knew that Kaufman had an open marriage, she had reason to hope that he would leave his wife and, and marry her and save her. She was always... She was always looking for a savior to save her from her alcoholism. Uh, and uh, she eventually, she, she had tried the Catholic Church, but that didn't help. And she was sure that Kaufman would. But Kaufman actually was very much in love with his wife, even though they don't, didn't sleep together. Uh, and uh, it was a losing. It was a losing battle for her. And um, Hollywood's reaction. What? Hollywood's reaction. Oh, this is, she was in the middle of shooting her best movie, Dodsworth. And um, when her husband, uh, in order to get a, her husband had stolen her diary and had found and had a record of all her extramarital affairs. And, uh, and it hit the court. And in the middle of this shooting Dodsworth, this trial began. And Sam Goldwyn had to, was being pressured by the other studios who were afraid of, the, of even more censorship than they already had. They, he was being pressured to let Mary Astor go and hire somebody else to reshoot the scenes that she already did. And uh, this is Goldwyn trying to, trying to decide. And you can see uh, he's so angry. This whole then scandal is Viola's, is Viola's fault. I told that bastard, look, I got Merle Oberon on the contract. If we put her in Dodsworth, we won't cost me a dime. But Mr. Big Shot, director tells me that only Mary Astor can play this role. Next time I need his advice, I'll give it to him. <laughs> anyway, the book is called Mary's Purple Diary. It was published a few years ago, and it's really, really good. And now uh, we're getting toward the end. So yes. here's Ed trying to finish his book. This, I'm trying to finish my Mary Astor book. And, uh, and I have to plead with death. that I only have two more drawings to do. Uh, so, um, so you're still I doing did it. make it. I did you made it. I, I made it. it. Yeah. And that's it. <laughs> right on the button. Um, we have we have some time for uh, questions, uh, but I don't want to leave this up on the screen. Instead, oh, there are two I want to show. Th this is all you know. Ed's greatest hits. There they are together. Uh, yeah, th these are much harder to recognize. So I'm going to tell you who they are. It's Nixon, Reagan, Meese, his attorney general, Gorbachev, Johnson, Kissinger, and Bush. And then here, they get to do Ed. So, who has a question? Go ahead. So this is the most I've ever laughed at Rizzoli, so this is very incredible to meet you. Uh, you as been shown, you've been the funniest part of so many serious magazines, New Yorker, Atlantic, The Nation, Esquire, but you also, for a time in the early years of National Lampoon, were, did so many incredibly funny covers. Actually, as a high school student from Lincoln High School in Brooklyn, I met you briefly, and Doug Kenny and Michael Donahue, and I interviewed them for my, the Lincoln Log, <laughs> I, I uh -huh. so fondly being there. So what was that, was that experience 
working for other funny people in a humor magazine different than working for the other magazine? I did very little for National Lampoon. And those guys, I, I wouldn't compete with those guys. Those guys were brilliant and they were funny. Uh, and uh, I had almost, I never met Kenny. I never, uh, I didn't meet any of the big shots. I met one of them, but I can't remember his name. Uh, I'm sorry to disappoint you, but oh, the only guy I spoke to was a guy named Grossman, I think, who was the art director. And, uh, well, the work you did for that and all the other things was incredible. And just oh, thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Who else has got a question? Yes, in back. Am I right that you're going to be 93 in two days? That's true. Mm -hmm. you, you got applause there for living. Nobody, el nobody else here has done that. I mean, that's something to be, well, I don't think. Yeah, I get, I get, well, I'm usually the oldest guy in the room, yes. Yeah. Can I thank you very much for Pushpin and all the stuff you distributed and all the encouragement you gave to artists through the Art Students League as well, and all your donations to the Society of Illustrators, who my dad was a member of as well over the years, because you really, really helped push a lot of people forward. I don't know if you know about it, but I'm telling you right now. <laughs> well, thank you. Yes. What is the secret? Of your longevity. <laughs> and second, do you have any thought or aphorism that you want to be remembered for? <laughs> Secret of your longevity, yeah. and is there an aphorism that you would want to be remembered? That what, what summarizes you in your own mind? Well, uh, Hokusai has is is said it all about, about, he talked about getting about when he was, when he will get middle age, he'll be able to do that. And when he gets older, he'll be able to do that. And by the time he's very, very old, he'll be a great artist. Uh, and uh, it wasn't an <coughs> aphorism, but it was a, um, a sense that I'm going to get better and better and better. And it's something that I still have. I still hope that I'll find a new way of doing something even better than I've done it before. Uh, and, but, and the other, the, uh, the secret, I, I hate uh, being serious and not, and not being amusing, but you know, you gotta be, you gotta have the right genes to live as long as I did. So uh, it has nothing, I, I do advise not smoking, however. <laughs> uh, uh, but there's no, there is no secret. So it, it, life is a crapshoot. Oh, you're winning. Um, Ed, could you talk a little bit about, um, about the series you did with Nancy, your wife, uh, called Brief Encounters in yeah. the Pages of the Atlantic and how you and Nancy worked together? Yeah, we, I, I left the, the drawing in my book that I loved most of all is between, shows Mary Cassatt showing her painting to Ed, Edgar Degas in her, in her apartment. Sometime in the 80s, Walter Bernard became art director of Atlantic Magazine, and he wanted a series, a feature, to appear every other month. And he asked me to come up with an idea, and my idea was to do, to, to do a series of first encounters. Vanity Fair in the 1930s had used Covarrubias, Miguel Covarrubias, to illustrate impossible meetings, like Greta Garbo meeting Calvin Coolidge, for example. <laughs> uh, and, uh, and I thought, well, they were brilliant, and it was funny, and um, but it would be interesting to know what happened in real first encounters. So I suggested it to to Walter. Walter suggested it to Whitworth, and uh, and for 14 years, Nancy and I did first encounters in Atlantic Magazine, and it was that was those were the pictures 
that I felt I became the artist that I always wanted to be. They were, I could do a watercolor and pen and ink one month, and then the next month I would do crayon. Or the next month I would do pastel. I, I could experiment because it was a two month time to do it. And, uh, and Nancy. Oh, I'm sorry, go ahead. No. Please. Well, Nancy, Nancy had, had been a writer when I married her. And uh, she, and now that the children were, <coughs> were going to college, this was, this was marvelous. It was paradise for both of us to work together on, on this thing. And, and, since, and since Mary, uh, since Nancy never, never got up, once Nancy was working, she just kept working. Whereas when I worked, I went to the refrigerator every five minutes. <laughs> uh, and uh, so I got a lot of work done. And, uh, and it was the best, it was, it, it was the best marriage and it was the best part of the best marriage, working on first encounters together. There's a, there is an Im imitator of Ed's, whose name I won't mention. Everybody in the business knows who he is. Who just he does what Ed, Ed does. Um, well, I'm going to have. I'm going to. I'm not going to mention his name, but his name is Victor Yuhash, and, and um, it sounds very much like that. And at a, at a at an illustrator's party, Ed walked up to Victor and said, so, Victor, how am I doing? <laughs> That's the question here. Uh, I was just going to ask if, if there are any young artists that you uh, particularly enjoy or um, follow regularly? Indeed. Uh, I, as I, I say in my book, uh, that the reason I didn't do, I didn't do many cartoons about Trump was because he scared the hell out of me, and I didn't know how how to do anything funny about him. Uh, Barry Blitt, who has, does, has done the most wonderful covers on the New Yorker about Trump, uh, is uh, I, I'm in awe of how brilliant they are. So, uh, <clears throat> so I and I think he's young enough to be called a, a young artist. Well, in, in your position. It's easy to say that everybody's here. <laughs> yeah. With that, um, happy birthday, and thank you. thank you, and there's some books to be signed. <laughs>